I'm Gold Derby editor Daniel Montgomery here with Star Trek Picard production designer David Blass. Uh, you know, you've worked uh, on the show for the past two seasons, uh, but what was your relationship with the Trek franchise before you came on board? I've always been a, a Star Trek fan since like going back to like my childhood. So it was always kind of like a career goal of going, God, I'd love to work on Star Trek. I mean, that would be like the ultimate. Uh, but, you know, it, it, in the industry, it's never as easy as that. There's no like, oh, queue up in this line and you'll eventually get the meeting to to go in and meet with Star Trek. And uh, and we hope you're prepared once, you, you know, for that meeting. So it's always been that thing where, you know, you turn left and right and then you end up in the right place at the right time. And uh, that's exactly what happened with Star Trek. So. I just finished uh, a show for Marvel that uh, kind of didn't end up going. And then uh, uh, the opportunity arose and they called my agent called me and said, Hey, uh, Star Trek wants to meet with you. And I'm like, yes. Uh, and the stars aligned. Uh, this season has uh, an element of nostalgia and referencing of the past. Uh, like how much of research and revisiting a track was needed to bring season three to life? Like you were a fan, but like, did you have to actively kind of go back and, and, and rewatch. Uh, one of the directives that I told my my staff because again a lot of people were were new to the to the Star Trek uh, universe and they were people I had worked with for years, and the guideline I gave them was that Star Trek is not a fantasy show. It's not a sci fi show. It's a historical drama that takes place in the future with sixty years of history that we have to get right. It's just like doing a World War II drama where you can't put a random chair and a random uh, sign. and a ra It all has to be very specific. And it's all cataloged. What Star Trek is one of the most cataloged uh, details, out, uh, you know, I IPs out there. So there's all the information that you would need, just like any other show. You just have to research it. And that's really what we started with was, you know, getting on board with everyone going, OK, no, 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 we have to get it right because the fans will call us out on it. And it's really knowing the history of the franchise, knowing, you know, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of what it is. And it's not so much knowing all the details, but also knowing that whatever you're doing, whether it's a particular alien race or a, or a architectural style, that it's been done before. Do your research and then create the best design possible. Uh, were there uh, Easter eggs that you included for those eagle-eyed Trek fans? I think what you know the the term Easter egg for me I think is overused. Uh, a lot of times it's that it's that random thing. Oh, you put in there just to to get a little uh, of clout. But for me, a lot of what are, were called Easter eggs were really uh, our links to the past, and it's the whole idea of nostalgia. It's the idea that Jean Luc Picard lived in a house. Uh, his family had lived there for centuries. So the idea that that place would accumulate items and he would accumulate items as he did, as we saw in the next generation, there was, you know, if he got the a flute, he kept it on his desk and all these little trinkets that he acquired became part of the set dressing for the show. And that informed the character. So by when we expanded that to a bigger house, we're like, he would continue that thing. He would have had family heirlooms that we had seen in previous episodes. And we kind of use that as our guide. So it's like, you know, the fans were like, oh, that that's the thing from this. And you're like, well, yeah, because he had it in his ready room on the Enterprise. And that's the thing. So we, we tied in a lot of that history. But again, I think nostalgia is one of those things that it, it's a tool that can be used. And when you have an artist like Terry Metalis, he uses it like, an artist painting with a, a particular brush. You don't use too much. You don't use too little. You just use right amount at the right time to get the artwork that you need. And I think that that's really what we try to do with all these notes to the past. Uh, one of the biggest nods to the past, of course, was putting the uh, original crew back on the bridge of the Enterprise from Next Generation. Uh, like, what were the challenges involved in, in recreating that iconic set? Again, with any with anything with Star Trek, you have to know walking in the door that it's going to be analyzed. It's going to be scrutinized. So we knew that we could not just kind of create the bridge. It had to be a museum quality replica that would stand up to the scrutiny, not only of the viewers, but the cast members who had once sat on that set. So it had to be identical. And that was the thing. It was a little bit of archaeology 
going through archives, finding people who had been on the set, who's got a photo, what, you know, what was your memory? Uh, because there wasn't like a, a Bible that said, oh, the paint color is, you know, Benjamin Moore 1125. Uh, it all had to be figured out from the from the past. And also the Enterprise set had changed multiple, multiple times over the of the course of the Next Generation series. So we settled on the season seven version as the most recognizable, most iconic. And then we meticulously went back to every detail from the carpet to the fabrics to the, you know, back in the day, they put actual, you know, cut in half pool noodles uh, around the the bridge of the ship just to add a little bit of detail it's like well we're not going to do the pool, mo pool noodles but we are going to get every nuance right and a lot of the stuff was you're talking about fabrics that have been discontinued for decades and carpets that is no longer in style so it's it's a lot of rebuilding and a, a lot of tweaking and the one thing that we was not uh exactly as it was in the past was we upgraded all of the monitors to make them actual live motion uh so the big reveal at the beginning of the of the uh the the scene they flip on the switch and all the monitors go Doo -doo 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 -doo, and they you know turn on in a beautiful way that we've never seen before but it is such an elegant uh beautiful transition that we kind of embraced the past but brought it into the new millennium with the uh, with the new designs now uh, this season uh also has the the borg as the primary villains and of course we've seen them many times before um you know you're creating this new borg cube uh what what went into that Again, much like uh, any everything else on the season, my job was not to rework and put my my stamp on things and make things differently. My goal was to give every fan, every viewer, the experience of visiting with old friends, even if they're bored. Uh, and the idea was to go back and mine all of the different times we had seen the Borg from the next generation and Voyager in the in the movies and and season one in Picard and say okay these are all the same group of people this is a, a culture built over time and I wanted the uh, cube to emulate that so there's bits and pieces from every single iteration of the Borg as if the this Borg queen had gone and you know stolen borrowed begged and put together this cube out of every part possible uh from the the entire history of the board race uh and again that that was fun because you know it really showcases the the history of what we were doing with star trek and again bringing it all back together one more time and uh speaking of villains you've also got vatic uh who's a very memorable villain in season and you know, her ship, the Shrike, is is uh, incredibly memorable. Uh, you know, what was what went into creating that ship? Uh, the the Shrike was was amazing on a couple of things with just Amanda Plummer. I can't say enough about what an astounding actress she was, and also someone who I was really excited to get to collaborate with when uh, she uh, got the the part. She reached out to Terry the Metallus and had him contact me, and she was very interested in working with me to design her chair because she's like you know for the first chunk of the of the time i'm there i'm really tied to this piece of set dressing i would love it to emote part of the character and i worked with her and we talked on the phone and she's like i would like to be able to lounge in different directions and do this and then and then she's like and i kind of I, I would like to spin i'm like of course it's gonna spin because of course, there's the the lineage to her father who played a Klingon commander and famously sat in his chair and spun around, you know, cry havoc and let re the gods, uh, the dogs of war. And it's like, so we, we allowed the chair to have a nod to that type of a feeling. We brought the headrest up similar to what his had and uh, widened it out so she could sit sideways and, and really to see her sit down in that chair and create that character uh, knowing that we had been a small part of it was just such a great experience. Uh, another memorable location is Metallus Prime. Is you know the the you know the crime, the gritty crime underworld that you get to work on there, uh, which is so different from a lot of uh, yeah you know, what else we get to see in the season. Um, you know what what sort of ideas and inspirations went into that? Early on in my career, I remember uh, shooting on the Warner Brothers lot and I was doing ER and we I had to design a couple sets uh, for a, a night scene and it didn't even occur to me at that time, you know, because one of my favorite films was uh, 
still is a uh, Blade Runner. And all of a sudden, you know, someone had mentioned something. And I'm like, I realized I was on the main Blade Runner street set. And I went back that night and watched the video. I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually designing a set on the Blade. And then it really, because we were doing a street in Chicago and you're going, wait, a street in Chicago and Blade Runner on the same location really showcases that you can do anything anywhere. So, you know, that taking that forward, here I am in the uh, American Snipers Iraqi village and turning that into this alien wonderland of evil and, you know, the bad places. Uh, and it was really fun because it allowed us to explore uh, an area that hadn't really been seen, the dark side, the the more kind of seedy side of, uh, of Star Trek. And uh, we had a lot of fun with it. They gave us a lot of freedom there, but we had this big area. And it's like, okay, but we created each little pod of cultures from an Orion to a Tellarite. And then we created the language and made sure that each one all synced up so that, you know, a viewer could be walking through and see all these different races and the, you know, get all over here to the Ferengi. And then same thing the the, the character of Sneed, you know, he says it in his dialogue. He's like, I like to cl uh, collect old things. We're like, Ooh, what old things could we pull from the past to allow you to collect them? And we went through a, the whole history of Star Trek things and Ferengi past and different little items that we could include because we never know what the camera will focus on and what, you know, will just see, be seen in the background. So we really wanted to pepper the entire world with all these great little treats. Now, uh, seasons two and three of the show were shot back to back. Uh, how difficult is that from a design perspective? Because the two seasons are are quite different from each other in terms of their focus and, and their locations. Season two and season three, I mean, we knew going into it that it was going to be back to back shooting. Well, we didn't know that it was going to be happening during a pandemic. Uh, so when we started the the shooting, it was just, OK, we're just going to do 20 episodes of Star Trek wow, that's going to be a challenge. And then it even get more challenging. Uh, the fact that seasons two and season three are so different uh, really took it to a new level because we're not able to amortize sets from one season to, to another. So, you know, in season two, we built this gigantic uh, chateau for Picard with two levels and a solarium and all these things and basements and season three, all that was gone. So uh, it became... A lot more challenging. Uh, you had to have a lot of different focus because, you know, the uh, your designs for the basement of Picard's chateau, uh, you know, that was from the 1940s, has to have a very different design aesthetic than a Federation Starfleet ship. So it was kind of a a good dance, but you know, it looking back on it, it was fun because the memories of sitting there going when people look at season two and season three, they seem as two very different things but you know the fact that we were working on them basically at the same time uh because as we're you know dealing with the basement of the Ch picard chateau and all that stuff we're still we're actually prepping building the titan sick bay and all these things so it was all happening all one on top of each other so it's it's a it was a juggling act to be certain uh, and and how did you collaborate with the visual effects department to enhance and extend the practical designs that you were able to create and also just any visual effects that were incorporated into into just regular scenes? Um, I have to say that, like, you know, after watching season three, they should just hand that Emmy to Jason Zimmerman and the visual effects team. Uh, just astounding on so many levels what they were able to do in the time and the challenge and the, the budgets. Um, what we would try and do is work as kind of a go-between between Terry, the writers, the director, and create the visual effects elements and get them to Jason in the most advanced, most developed state as possible. So working with uh, someone like Doug Drexler, who has been uh, working in Star Trek for decades, uh, he knows vis effects, he knows 3D modeling. So he would deliver them a ready to go uh ship model and it's like okay it's all figured out and it need, obviously needs texturing and a lot of his effects where but all the modeling the design work is 100 percent ready to go in three dimensions so it helps them move you know move further also it helps them budgeting wise so they're not getting a pencil sketch and saying here figure it out and then there's a lot of dialogue back and forth it's like here here's a, a 3d rendered great looking colored model of what we want and then 
you guys take it and run with it. And we were able to do that for all of our elements. A lot of the the uh, fleet museum ships, we were able to uh, build them all in house and then send them to Visifex. But then the Visifex, they just really just exploded it with with magic. I mean, it's just when you when you sit there and you imagine what it would be like and you're i'm one of the filmmakers and then you see the beauty shots and you see the the uh, the nebula shots and you go i'm like it's just astounding what they were able to do so uh it just hats off to them and it was such a, a great privilege to work with them um and you know speaking of uh emmys uh you know can you say what uh episode that you're uh you're submitting for production design uh and, and what made you select it uh we're 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 submitting uh episode two uh, of the season because it has a, uh, a a fair amount of uh titan and then we get into metallus prime and again you want to have the the most sets possible so it's really uh going through them and and picking out okay this and again with uh when you're not in your first season um you have to go through in a certain number of new sets have to be, have, there's a whole time issue thing so but we wanted something that really showed the scope of all of our new sets from the Titan, the sick bay, the transporter room, Metallus Prime, uh, the Shrike. Uh, so it's like which which episode has the most stuff in it? Uh, so and then uh, because we didn't make the time get enough new episodes or new sets in the in the episode, we had a second episode. So our submission has two episodes, and the second one is the finale, which obviously has the Enterprise D and the Borg Cube. Uh, well, uh, I want to congratulate you on all your work uh, on on you know these past two seasons of Star Trek, uh, and wish you and the entire uh, cast and crew uh, best of luck at the Emmys. Um, and thank you so much for talking to me about it today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's just a, we're just excited that that people that it's getting the buzz, and the great thing is getting people who ha haven't seen Star Trek or haven't seen Star Trek in a while tune back into the show and go wow that was 10 episodes of the best tv i've ever seen and you know we're getting a lot of that we have emails from people saying uh i cried i you know it reminded me of my dad and we connected and we had the thing and it emotionally hit on so many levels that we're so proud to have created something uh this beautiful yeah and it, it certainly hit me on that level too uh as a as a star trek fan going way back so uh thank you again for for uh, everything that you brought to that Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Daniel.